Welcome to Electron Online. Here we're going to attempt to show you how this equation was derived. This equation by now should look familiar if you worked with problems where you have to calculate what happens across a curved boundary when it is the refraction across the curved boundary. And we've learned that it was n1 over s plus n2 over s prime is equal to n2 minus n1 divided by r r being the radius of curvature, n1 and n2 being the indices of refraction on both sides of the boundary. So what we have here is we have a curved boundary. To the left, we have index of refraction n1. To the right, we have index of refraction n2. Why is n1 on the left side? Because that's where we place the object. We place the object at distance s away from the vertex, the point where the optical axis crosses over the boundary right there and s prime is a distance from the image to the vertex as well. Now, let's take it one step at a time. So we have an object and we draw a ray from the object to the boundary, a slight distance h above the optical axis. Notice that we have the line that's perpendicular to the boundary. So from the boundary to this point right there, where that's the center of curvature, this distance here is the radius. And I guess I should put down R for the radius. From there to there is the radius of curvature. Now, if we assume that the index of refraction n2 is larger than the index of refraction n1, the ray will bend towards the normal. So here we have theta sub 1, which is the angle between the normal and the ray of the incident ray, and so I should put an error right there. And here, theta sub 2 is the angle between the normal and the x, the transmitted ray. And I'll draw an arrow right there. So again, we would expect theta sub 2 to be smaller than theta sub 1. Using Snell's law, we can then write that n1 times the sine of theta 1 equals n2 times the sine of theta 2. By now, Snell's law should be familiar to you. We should also create some different angles. We have theta sub 1, which is, we can, or in other words, we can write theta sub 1, which is the incident angle of the ray relative to the normal, as the sum of alpha plus phi. Now, alpha is the angle relative to the, it's the angle between the incident ray and the optical axis. Phi is then the difference between theta sub 1 and alpha. So therefore, theta sub 1 can be written as the, as the angle alpha. Here, this angle here is, of course, the same as this angle there because those are alternate interior angles. We add to that this angle, let's call it phi. Phi plus alpha equals theta sub 1. Then we can also write theta sub 2 in terms of phi and beta. Beta is the angle right here. Notice that these two angles are the same. Those are alternate interior angles. And here we have theta sub 2. So theta sub 2 plus beta, these two angles together, they should add up to phi, and that's what we have in the equation right there. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to relate the angle alpha, beta, and phi to their physical construction. So we're going to use the tangent of each of the angles, and by definition, the tangent is the opposite over the adjacent. So when it comes to alpha, the tangent of alpha is equal to the height h, the opposite side, divided by the adjacent side, which is s plus delta. Delta is a small difference between where the vertex is at and the point directly below where, you, where the ray reaches the, the uh, curved boundary right there. So there's going to be slight difference here. We'll call that delta. So therefore, the tangent of this angle is the height h over this distance, which is s plus delta. We talk about the tangent of beta right here. The tangent of beta can be defined as h divided by s prime minus delta because s prime goes all the way to the vertex, so we have to subtract delta from that. So h divided by s prime minus delta is the tangent of beta. And the tangent of phi, notice phi here would be this angle, which is this angle right here. And phi can be defined as h divided by the radius of curvature minus delta, r minus delta. So now we've defined in terms of the tangent alpha, beta, and phi. Now we're going to make an approximation. For very small angles, and in this case we're going to be dealing with very small angles, the sine of theta is going to equal theta, 
and if it be theta 1 or theta 2, we can say that instead of writing sine of theta 1, we write theta 1. Instead of writing sine of theta 2, we'll write theta 2. So Snell's law now becomes n1 theta 1 equals n2 theta 2. If we then solve that for theta sub 2, we can write this as theta sub 1 times the ratio of n1 over n2. And since theta sub 1 can be written as alpha plus phi, we can write that theta sub 2 equals n1 over n2 times alpha plus phi instead of theta sub 1. All right, stay with me. We're almost there. Back to Snell's law in simplified format. n1 theta 1 equals n2 theta 2. And instead of writing theta sub 1, we're going to write alpha plus phi. So now this becomes n1 times alpha plus phi. On the other side, n2 Instead of theta 2, we're going to write phi minus beta. So phi minus beta. And if we then rearrange terms, we can say n1 times alpha plus n2 times beta, because n2 times a minus beta, when you bring it to the left side, becomes plus beta. So we have n1 alpha plus n2 beta is equal to n2 times phi minus n1 times phi, or we can write it as n2 minus n1 times phi. Now we'll go back to the way we define those three angles via the tangent. But again, since these are very small angles, the tangent of alpha is approximately equal to alpha, which means that alpha is equal to h over s plus delta. And since delta is such a small number, we can then say that alpha is approximately equal to h over s. And that's what we did over here. Alpha is approximately equal to h over s. Same with beta. Beta is approximately equal to h over s prime, which we can write over there. Beta is approximately equal to h over s prime. And finally, phi can be written as approximately equal to h over r. And over here, phi is approximately equal to h over r. In case we drop the deltas because they're so small, and since the tangent of alpha, the tangent of beta, the tangent of phi is approximately equal to alpha, beta, and phi, we can write it like this. And then, instead of alpha, we'll replace alpha in this equation by h over s, beta by h over s prime, and phi by h over r. This equation now becomes this equation. And finally, since we have an h in each of the terms, we can divide all the terms by h. We then end up with n1 over s plus n2 over s prime equals n2 minus n1 over r. And that is the equation that helps us determine the position and the size and everything else of the image, well, not the size because that's the magnification equation, but at least the position of the image based upon where the object is at and based upon the radius of curvature of the boundary and the indices of refraction on both sides of the boundary. Here is the equation that we have been using, and this is how the equation was derived, in case you were wondering. So if you ever looked at that drawing and go, wow, I'll never see my way through that. If you do it carefully, one step at a time, it's not so bad. And here's the answer. That's how it's done.